Hello, and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune. I'm Maya, a singer, songwriter, video maker, Oakland native, and expert at sleeping in for an extra hour. I'm also a huge fan of history. I love untold stories, gross facts, hidden secrets, and anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. Each day, I'm going to share one of my favorite deep cuts with you, so let's take a look at today's story. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365 with MXM Tune. On this day in 1918, the United States Congress approved daylight saving time by passing the Standard Time Act, also known as the Calder Act. When you stop to think about it, the way we keep time is pretty strange. Who decided that there's 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, and 12 months in a year? Okay. This wasn't a rhetorical question. The calendar system we use today can be traced back to the ancient Sumerians, who devised a calendar with approximately 360 days per year, and 12 months per year, with about 30 days each. For more on the fascinating history of telling time, check out the September 14th episode. But for now, let's jump back about 100 years to learn about how daylight saving time came to be and why we still use it today. There's a common misconception that founding father Benjamin Franklin came up with the daylight saving time, but that's not true. Rather, he wrote a satirical article in 1784 where he suggested that Parisians change their sleep schedules to save money on candles and lamp oil. As with many good jokes, there was a bit of truth to this. We know that due to our planet's tilt and its axis, we experience longer days in the summer and shorter days in the winter. So, in practice, daylight saving time exists to help us make better use of natural daylight. The first real proposal for what we now know as daylight saving time came from New Zealand's George Hudson. He was an entomologist, meaning that he studied insects, but he had some good insights into human behavior, too, it seems. He proposed this to the Wellington Philosophical Society, where people liked the idea, but didn't really do anything to make it happen. Then, in 1907, a British builder named William Willett proposed a paper called The Waste of Daylight, which urged the Parliament to adopt a daylight-saving bill. His proposal was to move the clocks forward and backward in 20-minute increments every April and September. But like Hudson's idea, his was never adopted either even though the famous Prime Minister Winston Churchill supported it. It wasn't until World War I that daylight saving time really caught on. To save money and energy during this tumultuous era, Germany was the first country to adopt daylight saving time in 1916. But the U.S. didn't follow suit until 1918, when President Woodrow Wilson signed the Standard Time Act into law. This idea was quite popular, especially among farmers. This gave them less time to harvest crops to sell at morning markets. So once the war was over in November 1918, Congress vetoed what they then referred to as wartime. Two decades later, when World War II hit, daylight saving time came back into vogue. In 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt reinstated the system for the whole country. But again, at the end of World War II, The people of the United States had to decide whether to stick with this strange, sometimes counterintuitive system of falling back an hour in the fall and springing forward in the spring. Between 1945 and 1966, daylight saving time was optional. There was no federal law mandating it, so individual localities could decide what to do. New York City just rolled with it and kept daylight saving time, so other states on the East Coast followed. By 1965, there were 18 states observing daylight saving time. 18 states where individual cities and towns decided whether or not to enact DST, and 12 states that didn't have DST at all. In other words, it was an absolute mess. It's already hard to schedule phone calls across time zones. Can you imagine having to keep track of all of that? In 1966, the United States passed the Uniform Time Act, I'm breathing a retroactive sigh of relief as I speak. The Uniform Time Act reinstated the time zones established by the Standard Time Act of 1918, which made it easier to determine where and when DST would be used. 
Now, Daylight Saving Time begins at 2 a.m. on the second Sunday in March and ends at 2 a.m. local time on the first Sunday in November. Every state in the U.S. follows DST except for Hawaii and some parts of Arizona. In Arizona, that's because it's so hot in the summertime, it's a relief for the sun to set earlier, not later. And since Hawaii is so close to the equator, there's not much of a variation in daylight hours from season to season. Worldwide, about 70 countries observe daylight saving time. But some notable exceptions include Japan, China, and India. One last interesting fact about daylight saving time, it makes sense that we fall backward and spring forward at 2 a.m., since most people are asleep, but what about people who work the night shift? It wouldn't be fair if they didn't get paid for the extra hour of work when they fall back in November. So, the Fair Labor Standards Act ensures that these workers get paid for the actual number of hours worked, even if the clock strikes 2 a.m. twice. For today's music fact, we have another special guest. John Batiste is here to talk about his new album out today on all streaming platforms. If you want to head over and listen to his new release after the episode. Now, here's John. So with the We Are album, I wanted to make an album that was genreless, but also specific. Something that was universal, but also captured a very specific experience. When I think about the music that I made on this album and the over 200 collaborators, including legends like Quincy Jones, Mavis Staples, writer Zadie Smith, and so on. I just feel very honored because it was really a way that I could capture what was going on around us at this time. You know, the nine months of this project overlap with the advent of the coronavirus, disruption of the music industry and charged political climate and some of social upheaval. And against the backdrop of me doing my job at The Late Show and writing the score for Pixar Soul, this album really came out and it's truly genreless and it's a gift to you all and I hope it resonates with you. Much love, and yes, indeed, loving. Oh, 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 and I should add, there's 16-bit video game samples, which are a huge influence on me since I was a kid, in the album, which I'm really happy to have blues and roots and Americana and jazz next to 16-bit and 8-bit samples. Thank you, MXM Tune. You're the best. And now for our final segment of the day, I'm going to be going back into my own photo archives to see what I was up to on a March 19th in my life. So on March 19th, 2020, I was playing Life is Strange Before the Storm. And now you're probably wondering, what? That doesn't even, that doesn't even matter. However, it was just announced that I'm going to be a part of Life is Strange True Colors, which is the new game for Life is Strange that is coming out later this year. So it's pretty crazy that nearly a year later after playing Life is Strange and being a huge fan of the franchise, I got to be involved with the making of the next game um, and being the singing voice for their main character, Alex. So that's my Maya fun fact of the day. Thanks for going back in time with me and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can come back tomorrow for more stories from the past. It's 365 with MXM2. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff. No, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365.